and it's a very practical talk, you know. I mean, I could talk about pen types, but I'm not going to. I do use them a little tiny bit, but that's really not very interesting for this talk. It just happens to be that I wanted to do something in Haskell that I couldn't do without the pen type. It's quite annoying, but anyway, that's just the way it goes. And um, I can do an Objective-C, I should point out, so it's annoying that you can't do it in Haskell. But anyway, well, you can now. But, anyway. but the real thing is, I wanted to say was that and this book's really got nothing to do with this talk at all, but it's a wonderful book and I'm rereading it again, and everyone should read it. It's all about how women uh, have been kind of forgotten in, in computer science but, and technology about how much they've played a role. Ada Lovelace is not the obvious one, but lots of other stuff. But when I was rereading it just the other day, there was this amazing quote from her, and this has nothing to do with women in computer science in this part of it, and she could talk much better about that. But a string, as in twine, uh, which has been dated to uh, 20,000 BC, they reckon we first built, she claims, anyway, at least, that we started to make uh, twine or string, whatever you want to talk. And it's, um, it's kind of helped us. To, it took this, there's a lot of evidence to say that that invention helped us to, as humans to kind of start thinking about things, start making things. Obviously, there's lots of other things you can point to. And uh, so for me, you know, twine's amazing, right? I use it all the time. I'm using it, my kids use it all the time. I'm actually using it in this project for other things, but that's a separate story, that's more of a qualitative based research that we're doing with it. And so SVGs are like that for me. Hopefully everyone's heard of SVGs, you know, and um, there you go, just a, another uh, markup language for describing them. They have excellent, they do all oh, those sorts of things. It's really cool. I got, on this project, I actually got, finally got to implement a 2D path tracer and renderer, which is pretty cool. I'll talk about that a bit later. But they're also something that a lot of people outside of computer science are familiar with. You know, musicians, I've talked to quite a few musicians, are familiar with SVGs and, you know, illustrators and people like that use Illustrator or they use, you know, open source variants of them or some things. These are all basically vector-based packages. They can all output SVGs. And of course, if you, I'm sure many of you know the history of Flash and how the world decided they hated Flash. So all Adobe did was now export it as SVGs and go, Adobe Animate will generate you a website which uses SVG animations and everything, rather than Flash. Man, they've got around, it's pretty cool. Oh, look, my pretty good honestly. Sweet. Yeah, it's okay. So, right. Fingers crossed, my magic finger. Okay, yeah, I'll keep talking. Sorry, you will keep going. That's weird. Okay, anyway, so. <laughs> okay, I'll keep talking. Sorry, I'm going to go. So, what this talk is all about is SVGs and how we can use them to describe interfaces. So, I would be showing you now some slides that would um, talk about, um, if you look at musical instruments, I've got you know the history of musical instruments, and particularly in the West. I'm not going to talk. I'm not that experienced with it beyond the West. But you know we could start with kind of about 1600. We started to as we got the printing press, music started to formalise and instruments started to be um, standardised. You know part of that process. Amazing to think the connections. But anyway, if you look, oh I've got my second slide. Brilliant. I can go to it. Here is some examples. It's not flat, you know, stop flashing. See there you go. And you've got the musical instruments at the top. The history of it. You know we get up to the 1950s, we've got the analog sims, all that sort of stuff. We've got the BBC workshops. This is not Delia Smith, I've forgotten her name now, but she was from the 1980s. She was the next generation of people working in the, the, uh, so, uh, the sound workshops at the BBC, not doing the Doctor Who soundtracks, but doing lots of the 1980s kind of sound effects. And stuff. Oh, I'll just deal with it. It's, and it's, and it's, then you got Flash, right? You know, he came along and he started to say that, I mean, he wasn't the only person, of course, that musical interfaces and musical instruments could be all sorts of things that we'd already invented for other reasons. Records obviously had a huge impact on the 20th century. And then we get to today, 
And there are some amazing people doing some absolutely amazing things with live coding. It's not completely my cup of tea. It's pretty cool, right? I just don't enjoy going to it. I certainly don't do it. That's just me personally. But it's pretty amazing. But the reason I don't do it, I think, is that I sit at my laptop enough of the day for the last 30 years or whatever, when I did my PhD in Nottingham with Graham and everything. I spent a long time having laptops since then. And I kind of got a bit tired of sitting at my laptop. And the only reason I make music is to do something else. Okay? And so I wanted to be able to move away from the laptop. This is just annoying. Anyway, sorry. The, um, so, in the, rolling forward a few years to the last couple of years, Queen Mary, uh, some people from out of Queen Mary, Andrew McPherson and others, have developed this board, which is basically, you think of it as a, a low latency DSP processor. You know, it's a test. It's got lots of stuff. It's designed specifically for audio. It's really great. And it has lots of these little pins. If any of you are familiar with electronics, you know, you get your analog and digital pins and stuff and things. And it's and it's got these audio stuff here, super low latency. But the key, key thing about it is to be doing action to sound. So I, if you're a drummer and you hit it, you want to hear the sound, particularly you want to hear it in less than five milliseconds if possible, 10 milliseconds, you know. Guess what USB is like? Anyone know what USB is like? So this is not my work, this is Andrew's work and others. Guess what it looks like? About, what do you reckon on Windows? Anyone got an idea how many milliseconds USB might be? 100? It's not that bad. It's, it's around, I think it's between 10 and 20 on average. 10, between 10 and 20, so guess what happens? Woo, woo hoo, it bounces like crazy, right? You get jitter. Guess what musicians hate more than latency? They hate jitter, right? Because it's really hard to follow and repeat. If it, it's a nightmare. Okay, so that's more of a side effect of this work. But what I wanted to do was be able to allow musicians who aren't necessarily computer scientists, or actually aren't computer scientists very often, they're technically aware, you know, they know how to use things like Max MSP and stuff, and to, to build Interfaces. Why would you want to build interfaces when you could buy all these brilliant ones? Well, absolutely, I've got that one there at the top there for my Ableton. I love it. And you can get these ones. Okay, they're a bit different, right? But they're not that different, are they? They're kind of similar. And uh, oh God. this one, guess how much this one costs? Anyone got any ideas? Think about it like they're really grand. That was a lot. It is a lot. I think four thousand dollars. If you think about it, it's about three thousand pounds. It's an amazing piece of engineering, right? It's really amazing, and you can do all sorts of things for it. As you play, you can follow scales. You can do all sorts of stuff. It's a beautiful instrument. But you know, not many of us can buy particularly if it's a hobby. But even if you're a professional musician, you know, and you're an electronic musician, you might not be buying that. Okay. And the problem with it, of course, is that it's fixed. So other musicians have tried to build their own interface and lots of amazing stuff. I think. I think there is someone from Bella. Is there someone from Bella here today? I'm sure there was someone from Queen Mary, but maybe not. Anyway, they, um, I'm pretty sure all of these, except this top one here, um, use Bella in some way to generate sounds and do thin things. And they're really cool, right? They're really great. You can build stuff. This is a long blog about this one. It's built re re reproducing a 1980s drum machine and stuff like that. But that's a lot of work. <laughs> And the reason I bring up that blog, the, blog, the guy blogged about it, and he pointed out that he spent a year basically not making any music, but making that. You know, which is great, but if his job is making music, then, you know, that's not so great, right? And of course he did other stuff, you know, I'm not trying to say that. So, there are other stuff going on. This is uh, made by a friend of mine. This is uh, a glove where you can get all sorts of amazing trackings used to uh, lots of dancers, use it, and other musicians. Imogene Heap, if you've heard of her, she uses it, she's a big advocate over it, and there's some people from MIT that have also worked on it. I'm not doing any of this stuff. This is kind of beyond the reach of that. I, the work that we're interested in is building, oh, sorry, went too far, interfaces, which are fairly standard, right? Here's one that I'm going to show you in a bit. That's just got some MCP style drum pads. It's got a play and a stop, you know, and a record button and things like that. This is actually on what's called swell paper. Does anyone know what swell paper is? No, well, if you're blind, then you probably wouldn't know what it is. It's basically used for not long-lasting braille. But if you know, if you want to print something out quickly and use braille, then this is a very common thing to use. And it's just if you use, ever use a laminator, you print it onto carbon, it has to be carbon. Anything that's not carbon is not raised, so if you've got that, just put it through a laminator, and out the other end, you get this raised thing. And depending, well, it's not a laminator, sorry, it's a special heat thing, but it's basically worked like a laminator. And you actually get different things, and so you can actually adjust 
the heat of this. And you can do some amazing stuff with this. For example, here's one where we've been playing with gradients, where depending where, how much colour we're introducing, as long as it's got some carbon in it, you'll get different amounts. If you run your hands over this, you start to feel it feeling like a slider. You know, and actually, if you are uh, having problems with seeing and so forth and things, then you can actually use this to guide your way. You know, we can print things and done. So I should have said at the beginning, a lot of this work has been done in collaboration with Karina, uh, who is a professor in fine print at uh, my university at Ewing. And she will talk all about 2.5 printing, whatever that means, and who knows. But what she is is amazing. She has loads of different types of stuff that we've been experimenting with and playing with to try out. This is a UV printer where you can build up multiple layers so you can actually stack it on top. Turns out, which you've only just discovered with an intern recently, that you can actually stack it on top of the braille. So you can actually even color this as well and do other things as well and things. But also you can do fun things, road signs and stuff. If you're familiar with this book, which is a, a, all a book about design and everything, they spend a long time, he spends a long time, he's a very famous uh, industrial designer from Italy, he spends a long time talking about road signs and how they kind of work across the world. So we can start to design funny things. And of course, you show this to musicians, what do they want to do? They want to design funny things. Okay, so that's the rest of my talk. It's really about how can we make it accessible to musicians and, and, and a way that aren't brilliant at programming. You know, not that they're, not, they're not bad, but they're not experts. They certainly don't know what a dependent type is. And I can tell you, they've got absolutely zero interest in knowing what a dependent type is. You know? And I don't mean that badly at all. You know, actually, I re I've enjoyed reading some of those papers, these Conrad Bright's papers and stuff and things. Uh, not all of them, I've got to admit, but they're just not. Okay? And it took me a while to understand these papers, to be honest. All right, so what we've done is we've designed a little system. Oh, really weird. It keeps doing that. Okay, which has got some computer chips in it. You know, I'll do some electronics too and things like that. Some of to that. That just this allows us to connect to this thing here, which is called a Sensor. It's made by this company, a startup company in uh, Silicon Valley. It has 20,000 pressure sensors on it. They're very, they're sub 0.5 millimeter, and they can take, you know, they're basically, it's not capacitive or anything, it's purely um, pressure based. And so, of course, you can lay stuff on top of it and things like that. There's ways that you can get it that even if you print, I haven't brought it with me, but, you know, we do silicon molds as well and things like that, and you can print that out and get on there. So, okay, but this talk's not really about that. It's just the motivation. It's about how do we get from there to, um, the, you know, generating these interfaces. But also, as soon as you generate those interfaces, they need to connect to other things, right? And, of course, that's where programming comes in. That's where the skills of engineering comes in is that it's no good just being able to print these on paper. Once you've printed them, you need to map them to a way that can generate and connect to your music software or Ableton, or as we were just talking about, potentially taking CV outs and connecting to your own modules or whatever. Okay, so that led us to thinking about the digital music instrument. This Thor Magnusson, who's from Surrey University, presented this diagram about 2009 at a music conference called NIME, and uh, it's a very famous uh, new musical instrument. Oh, I wish you could stop doing that. And the key thing is that he separates out the sound production, all the DSP and everything, and brings it and allows us to talk about gestural control. In particular, you know, we've got these inputs over here. And you could have a more complicated system, and some modern systems where you have haptic feedback, you know, things like that. I'm not going to talk about that today, although we have started to think about how we could integrate that and things like that. You know, and obviously you can have other feedback, like sonic feedback to your thing. But it's allowed us to just to isolate to talk about this. And once we've got, I'm just going to ten minutes left. Allowing for some questions. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to speed on. So this is what it looks like. The system. It's I'll name it on the projector. No, it's got some input files. They're called. Um, I call them uh, music interface files, but they're basically it's Haskell. It's just that I don't want to talk about Haskell when I talk about some people. I just want to present them as a, a way of implementing. It's a DSL, all right? And implement like that. And so you can see the little lambda that does that. That creates SVGs. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Then once we got this SVG, and SVGs are great because you can annotate them with additional attributes, right? They have all the things like color and all that and stuff, but you can add your own attributes, which is the key to it, of course. And then you can, um, we've got, if you want to generate this, and I'll talk a little bit about why, why is this in Rust and not in Haskell? Partly because I really want to learn Rust, but actually there is another reason, and it's performance, to be honest. And, and I'll talk about that. Can you imagine writing a 2D renderer in Haskell? Yeah, it might work, but I'm not going to do it. I'm sure you could do it, but you know, I found it quite easy to do it in Rust, and I wanted to learn Rust. And we generate JSON, and JSON 
is what allows us to map to different devices. So in the Sensor, for example, we have a Rust-based driver that basically talks to the, to the, um, the Sensor and reads information about touch and pressures and what mappings you've done to map into where and what you want to do. And, and over here, you've got, I can't get it out now because we accidentally broke it, but there's a little light pad, it's called, made by Roly, and this is an embedded device and you actually generate code for it, and it runs a C like language called Littlefoot. Some of you may be aware of it. The most bizarre language I've ever seen, but there you go. It's, you know, it's C ish, something dynamic wonder or loops or thing. Anyway, it's an odd language, but you have to generate some output here. So, this is a great application for things like Haskell and DSLs, right? And in our case, we're using SVGs in some ways to be a DSL. I'm just extending that, it's just another thing. So, we've got a little program I haven't got long. I'm just going to limit ourselves to this. What would you expect it to look like in Haskell? So this is where the dependent types are creeping in, is that we've got some combinators, some different functions for describing things. Some of them are built in, like stop, because you know, it's such a common thing to want to do. But as I'll show you in a second, we're using this special syntax here called bang and, and hash thing. First class labels, if you're familiar with that. And um, this gives you a first class label. This allows you to have oh, <laughs> real good. Uh, one of the things that you get from SVGs, and one of the things that we got straight away was when people wrote this, they were like, well, why can't I put Y first? Why can't I put X? Why do I have to put X first? Why would you have to do that? It's really annoying, right, that you have to do it. You don't think like I mean, I don't, because you know the type of the function, and you're like, okay, that, yeah, that Y actually got the same type, so that's quite annoying. But, um, but why do you need to put it right? In, in, and someone actually said, this is a guy who's not programmed, but in Objective-C, you can do it. And you're right, because they have the, and you can do it in Objective C. Sorry. So anyway, it turns out you can do it in Haskell too, just a bit of dependent types, first class labels, you get it. Just not. <laughs> and um, here you go, and we can do things like, so a stop button is clearly just a pad, and here we can start talking about what events are going to be generated for them. So we can build them in, but users can actually add additional attributes and start to describe what events are going to be generated. So for those of you who are familiar with MIDI and OSC, then, which is another type of protocol for communicating musical events. OSC was developed at Berkeley, uses kind of URL style, part of Linux, I suppose, not Unix, not Ops, and a BSD. And you can describe, you can actually write things like slash sequencer, slash stop, or something like that, and things like that. So I'm going to move a bit quickly. It's a monoid, so you can compose them together, just as you would expect. I mean, SVGs is, is a monoid. I should say, I want the reason I did this work, the reason I ended up with SVGs and everything, is because of the diagram. How I found out about Farm because it's an amazing package, and just there was a paper in 2012, was it, which is on the monoids, and it's one of the best papers I read while I was working in industry. Well, I didn't read a lot of the ICFP papers, I've got to be honest, but that's just a beautiful paper, and certainly was an inspiration for this work. I don't have to talk about bloody monads and things. Just <laughs> monoids, so yeah. Anyway, you can get where my life is coming from. You need it to be an interface, so we, the user has to describe an interface. They can capture that. This is pure Haskell code, so you can start. The great thing about it. It's because we're generating SVGs. You could write your interface in Illustrator. How long have I got? Five minutes, brilliant. You could write your interface in Illustrator. You have to go in and annotate it a bit to get the right uh, parameters attached to it and things like this. But you could do that. And do you think the musicians did that? What do you think the musicians did? Anyone got any idea what the musicians did? They drew it on pencil, scanned it in, and sent it to me. That's what they did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they did. That's how they wanted to build their interfaces. Fair enough. And so this obviously expands to small domain-specific language. There isn't a lot in it. There's a little bit, as I say, a little bit of dependent types and implementation. Nothing too smart. We're not. We could do some more smart things about how you compose things together. Not let some things be valid, some things valid. But to be honest, I'm just not interested in that. And certainly our users aren't that interested because they're just not that complicated. You know, we're not trying to prove anything to anyone. The only reason they use dependent types is not to prove anything. Well. Obviously, I am proving something to the um, type checker, but I'm just using it for convenience so they can uh, name their arguments and they can be in different orders. So that's, that is a benefit I found out. Okay, the rest the representation is just as you'd expect. Underlying it, we have kind of, it can all compile down to SVGs, and once you've got an SVG representation, you've just got a pretty printer and you're printing it out to SVGs, right? There's nothing really smart going on. And if you can see this or look about it, this is what an SVG that's generated looks like. It does have a couple of fixed things, so it needs to know about the device that it's being targeted because they, they're, they're of a certain resolution, those sorts of things. But there's really not that much going on. It's not, it's not particularly smart. 
I haven't got very long. So once we get the SVG, we're going to compile it. it. Took me a little bit of time, so I have a graphics background. After I did my PhD in type theory, I went and worked on graphics for 20 years. You realise that C really is a terrible language. But anyway, you worked a long time on it and using it. But there is, it is a terrible language, and, but there are some really amazing things going on in that community. They're doing some really smart stuff. But if you've ever been to SIGGRAPH, there are some very, very smart people doing stuff that I can find just as hard to understand as I do at ICFP, right? You know, there's some really good stuff. And it's really amazing, you know, and actually it's equally as fun and interesting. But one of the things they have is a graphics pipeline. Anyone recognize this as a graphics pipeline? In graphics, you have a bunch of vertices, you shove them in, you assemble them, that happens on the GPU. Basically, you're attaching things like graphic uh, color attributes and all that to the vertices so you can then shade them with on shading or whatever. And so I'm calling this shape assembly, they call it, um, what do they call it? Vertex, no, primitive assembly they call it. And then we've got tessellation. So tessellation is the, what we're gonna need to do, right, because we've got paths. We've got basically 2D vectors <coughs> and we need to create a rasterization, okay? I can't, rasterize 2D paths. So what I do is I tessellate them, i.e. I turn every shape that I've got into triangles, and once I've done that, it's fairly standard in the maths, and you can take the edges and draw your points inside or outside. And so the key point is, we give a unique ID to every uh, shape that we're bringing in, and then we generate an array, right, with the indices for that. So now, if you think about how this will work, Basically, I touch here. What do I get when I touch this? I get a pressure point, obviously, but I get an XY coordinate. What are 2D arrays really good for? Give me an XY coordinate. I could say they're never going to be out of bounds, and so I can check that. But, you know, Rust doesn't, does that for me anyway, right? I run time, so I don't worry about it. This is what it would look like if I tessellate it. This is what it looks like when I pixelate it. I mean, maybe not quite like this, but you get the idea of rasterization. I have to pick some edges. So this is a pain for us because some users really hate it when they can't touch right at the side of the controls, but obviously we have to, we, we are doing rasterization, and we you know we've done tessellation, and we're going to miss a bit sometimes, and so it is a little bit of getting used to. If you look at the triangle on this one, for example, here doesn't always hit. You know, it does feel even there. So my daughter who's got really tiny little fingers, really annoying. She kept getting right to the corner. I mean, she's not annoying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and then. And then simply uh, take this, actually for this one, it's actually pretty much, as I said, the implementation is pretty much what I said. It's a basic array lookup, going from that, it's just implemented in Rust, you know, no, nothing smart. They've got a little, really nice little C API, really easy to just bind into Rust. It's one of the amazing things I say about Rust. Anyone who's using Rust, it's just the way that you can just link to C code. And also you can make your Rust code pretend to be C code, which is great. I really like that. Um, of course, Littlefoot doesn't have any of those things like loops and all that sort of stuff. It doesn't have arrays, which is really annoying. So guess what happens here? Well, this is the process of reverse engineering the whole of the rasterization phase and generating <laughs> shape tests. Okay. And so you might ask why I shouldn't just do that in the first place. Well, the problem is I said right at the beginning of this talk, I cared about latency. Okay. And so shape tests for squares, that's pretty cheap. But if you've got a Bezier path and things like that, that's pretty expensive, right, in general, to do shape tests. And if you really want to get down to latency of sub five milliseconds, you don't want to be doing anything but a memory lookup, right? And this is a pretty small thing. Even on an embedded device, you know, we're talking about, these are running at 40 megahertz. You know, you don't want to be doing expensive geometric computations. Just, just not the sort of thing you want to do. That's what it looks like. I've got to finish. Um, you can answer the question fine a little bit. Okay, well, it's not that much. I've already said to you that I've got the, we generate uh, code for these things. We generate code for the little foots, and we've got an application. I can, it's easy to show you it working, is that right? Yeah? So, here's a bit of code, hopefully you can see it. Up here, I've got an empty interface, it's a monoid. And so if I jump here, it gives me an empty interface, because it's an empty. In fact, the course, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's heard of Blue Peter, I know some of you would have done, but they like to do things, prepare everything beforehand, you know, it's like all the meal and just bring it out slowly and whenever they do stuff. So I prepared it beforehand. And if I do that, obviously I can start to build up an interface. I'm not gonna do anything too much, but I've got a record down here as well. I've got the exact interface that we talked about. Go down to the bottom, I'll get the play. And you can see all the pipeline happening live. It's generating the SVG. And there you go, that would be that. And then we can simply generate, run the Rust program, that will generate the interface. I should probably show you one thing. Use this here. So 
I don't know if you can see that, but I've got a little JSON file, so I am cheating a little bit. I knew that I was going to generate this farm, got JSON file. I've got a JSON file that tells my driver where that JSON file is. You know, I could add it, be a bit more smarter and have things like, well, I haven't got around to doing that yet. So I have a little Swift app that allows me to connect. Only one more. Okay, and then great. We'll have to start switching, um, All right, okay, I'll things. stop. Uh, perfect. If I go here, sorry, can anyone see Max? Oh, there it is. So I haven't, Max is an application for this we use commonly in Cordio programs. So that was the other thing I found. I want to just, that little tidbit was when musicians want to program, if they're not computer scientists, this is the program they arrive and tell you that's so brilliant. I, I just leave it at that. I just, you know, C is brilliant. But Max is mind-bogglingly complicated, I find it very weird. And you haven't, yeah, I find it weird. But anyway, I use it, you know. And this is just a little driver I've got, a little app I've got that just takes OSC messages and converts them to MIDI. And um, I've trained it, but I'll stop there anyway, and I could have shown you a little demo, but maybe I'll just stop. Yeah, we should probably... Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so, um, let's thank our speaker. And, uh, yeah, let's get you mm -hmm. setting up. Are you going to try and, a different uh, I will try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do some <laughs> Sorry questions. Sorry about that. Right. Questions? Do we have any Slido stuff? Okay, I have a question. So you're generating down to Littlefoot. I am in one part. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that, um, I've worked with that a bit. <laughs> and it has a very fun um, 4K memory limit. If I remember, it's like the, the program size to be loaded onto a rolling block is actually yes, very restricted. It is. Do you run into limitations? So, uh, oh sorry. I'm no, 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 no. You will answer question. Uh, yeah, so do, do I run into questions? Only ones that we've contrived. So yes, I've run, you know, when I've generated interfaces that are, um, have lots of presets. So what I've got is that you can also describe each one as a preset. And what I mean by that is that, um, you can just switch pages, you know, so you can have like multiple things between the controllers and there's a little side button that you use. So if we generate like 20 presets, then, okay. then we ran out, you know. But in practical terms, you don't but have to. In practical terms, I, d I didn't generally, but we're not doing anything but controlling the code, right? We're not doing any kind of generative stuff. As soon as I've run out a little bit when I, when I want to do programmatic stuff on there, you know, very straightforward. From, from handwritten programs on the little foot, I have definitely bumped up against right. that, so it makes me wonder if this could actually be sort of more efficient way. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it could be a way to, to sort of get away from writing, because uh, this line count right. gets you. Yes, with that. line count gets you. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's an interesting yeah. possibility there. Anybody, anybody else? We have time for like one more. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the printing of those interfaces, is that easy to do outside of your workplace? Because I can see other applications for... for so how do you mean by printing? You mean just... Well, because you basically designed the way the where you started your talk with those uh, yep. stealth papers. Yes. So you can print interfaces in all different ways. So that, that's, that was one of the things about this. So you can just print them on plain paper, and they work. You can print them on, as you say, Braille paper or swell paper. And then we, have, we do have some other engines, ones that um, open SCAD, if you're familiar with that, you can generate, you know, uh, where well you can generate silicon cast models for that. But we're also doing other things where we're looking at kind of Euclidean rhythm and things like that. And so we're starting, because we're very interested, well, I say we, one of my students is very interested in rhythm. So there's lots of different ways you can take them. Some of them are cheap, and some of them require that you have a unit. Well, I'm very lucky to have a university and a printing department that have lots of amazing tools, you know, so, and it's a scale. You know, 3D printing probably not unreasonable, but we also have CNC machines, which, you know, and laser cutters, and 600 watt laser cutters, so they're expensive. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. And up next we have Christina, who's going to tell us about uh, some Haskell games. Mm -hmm. Hi. So if anybody cannot hear me, just wave when I try to speak louder. So if I see this sign, I will just try to be louder. So we are creating games written in Haskell, running on Android, iOS, and desktop. And here you see six of our games. And 
We think Haskell is a cool language to write games, but only if you manage certain challenges. And about three of our challenges I want to talk about today and how we approach them and what we are doing to overcome these challenges. So what you see here <coughs> is that we have a lot of I.O. that we have to deal with. We have animations, we have different input devices like um, mouse events, keyboard events, touch events, Vmode Connect. And we even need to know which screen orientation we are running on. And this can change during the game. We also have to render many, many things. So you might wonder whether we are going into I.O., we touch it and we just stick there. So whether we are just writing one block of I.O. code. But no, we are not. We are writing real, pure code. And how we are doing this is one point what I want to even idea to you today. A second challenge that we have is related to maintainability. So right now we have more than six games, six you can see here, but we want to have more. And the question is, how can we get more? So it's very important to have a good structure. So the first thing is we want a structure that probably can build up all of our games. So if you know one of our games, you already know all of our games. And there are only minimal parts of game-specific parts in there where you have to focus when you're writing one game on its own. But you can even share a lot of code um, using libraries. So this is one part. The second part is that we want to write compositional code. This means that, for example, the main menu does not even know about the ga um, game itself, so the game state. And for example, the level loading screen does not need to know anything about the game finished screen. And if you're writing a game like this, then you can focus on the parts that you want to figure out something about in the moment that you need to. So you can really focus and don't need to think about, oh, what's going on in the rest of the game? I don't care at this moment. I can really focus on what I need to do. So the second question is, how can we get such a compositional structure? And our third challenge is related to the input, backend, and platform. So as I already said, we have different inputs. We also have different backends, for example, SDL, SDL1, 2, so SDL is the simple direct media library. We're also running on different platforms, Android, I.O., desktop. And while I'm creating a game, I really don't want to care about this. This is something compilation should do, but I don't want to care about it. While I'm creating the game on its own, I don't want to think about this. And how we are doing this, I also want to try to give you an idea what's going on there. So here you see three of our challenges, and let's start with the first one. This is some code how we rendered before we had our new structure. So you see here, we want to render a ball, or we want to paint a ball, and we are getting some resources over here. This is something like what we already loaded, some images from a path. Then we have a surface. This tells us that we, uh, this code is written for SDL1. And we get some information about the object itself. And then we need to figure out something about the position, the size, getting the image itself. And then we can render it, which is SDL related right now. But this code is sub-ideal. What happens if we want to use HTML instead of SDL? Which lines would we need to change? So, all but both sides? <laughs> not exactly that hard it is, but at least this size um, parts uh, down there, where we have SDL, this definitely needs to change. What happens if we want to transform all of our um, stuff that we want to render? For example, if we think about, oh, now I want a menu bar on the side, then I need to move everything around. What do I need to change? So one idea could be that we are adding a displacement variable at the beginning, and we are just adding it up here to our position. This is one option. There are many options. If we not only have a paint ball, but also paint wall, we need to add this to every hour function. And the third point is, this is the rendering. What happens if the logic 
also want to know where the ball was so that we can see whether someone was clicking on the ball. Then we need to recalculate what's going on over there. So this part needs to be found in the logic part as well. If you're adding displacement, then we would also recalculate this part as well. And that's a really big issue because then we need to du duplicate code. So these are three problems that we have and now I want to give you an idea how we get rid of them. So starting with the back end, what we are doing is we are creating our own image specification. And there we give everything that all of our backends would need. So here it's a path and the nothing stands for um, uh, alpha channel mask that the PNG could have. If it does not have, it's just a nothing. And what we are doing here, we are then adding a resource ID and with this ID we can match and map to this um, image specification. So in our games we are just talking about these resource IDs. And our backend packages do some rendering with the render environment for each package. <coughs> Somehow with the resource ID, here's a position where to render it, and then this do, does the I.O. So what we could here do now is additionally creating a collage. And then we have the hidden structure outside. So right now we're getting the first part of the rendering we have in here. So we know the resource ID, which was related to the image that we want to render, and the position. And now we have this part also obviously here, and we can use it. And sometimes you don't have only images, but you want also to add visual texts or some rectangles. So we have a even more sophisticated element, which is visceral element, where we can um, have filled rectangle. For example, here we have the color ID plus the size, and the visual text, which has the font ID, a color ID, and then the text mes message itself. And since collages are monoids, we can just put them all together. And then we can render this with our backend. So now we don't have to think about the backend anymore while we are creating our game. We can do some transformation over all of our collages at the same time. And then still is the question about the hidden structure. We have some information here already, the position. But if we need more information for the logic, we are adding widgets. So we're getting an ID additionally and a size. And with this information, we can go in the logic without I.O. Here is no I.O. in the collage, is no I.O. and can just get the information that we need. And that's for us pretty cool to have like this. And what this means is just that we have a rendering which has two steps. We have the collage where we just create everything that we want to render and then the backend package says, okay, now we are rendering in the real world. The problem here is that widget size is not always known, especially for visual texts. In SDL and SDL2, you need to render to get the se uh, text size because we're getting it from for, uh, foreign function interface and there we're just getting it in I.O. And this is right now a problem that we have. We probably can argument that it you can use unsafe perform IO, but it's not the only function that we need there and we're always getting into this, into this problem at this point. So this is still a question how to handle this at this point. So we saw now how we get our functions and our games pure. So in our games itself, we don't have the IO anymore. It's just the rendering which is done in the package. So now let's go to our compositional structure. Imagine that these two are two games that you have. The blue whitish parts here is game specific. Here are the lighter ones are game specific. The green ones, so these are shared code. So it's a package that you're using. And suppose that someone tells you, here's a bug. You start to fix it. 
And then you're thinking, well, is it also in this game? So you're searching, where is it? Hmm, probably here. Oh, I implement it in a different way. Oh, now I need a new solution to find to do it. This is something we really don't want to have. What we try to do is have the same structure and find as much as possible shared code. And what we are doing here is what I really, really like. So every game has something like sensing, updating, and rendering. This is a common structure for a game.